Now, as I've already said, uh, the other popular approach uh, to the problem of evil is Hicks, Irenae, and Theodicy. Uh, it's the one that uh, most students I've met uh, seem to gravitate towards. Uh, and in its emphasis on the importance of free will, it has some of the same uh, issues as the free will defense. And it too relies on a kind of eschatological resolution. So if we look at uh, uh, an essay by uh, John Hick, uh, we see him make this very point. Hick writes, I want to insist that this eschatological answer may well be true. Expressed in religious language, it tells us to trust in God, even in the midst of deep suffering, for in the end we shall participate in his glorious kingdom. Uh, now, Hick is aware of the fact that this uh, may strike people as cold and is not necessarily helpful to those people who are uh, going through intense periods of suffering. In fact, he makes this very point only lines before the quote I've just read out. The thought that humankind's moral freedom is indivisible and can lead eventually to a consummation of limitless value which could never have been attained without that freedom and which is worth any finite suffering in the course of its creation can be of no comfort to those who are now in the midst of that suffering. Now, there's something uh, which could seem like uh, hard truth telling about Hick's response, and this would then apply to the free will defense uh, as well. Uh, namely, that just because something is uncomfortable or off-putting doesn't make, uh, make it not true. Uh, it may just be the case that human beings have to go through some forms of suffering in order to have the free will necessary uh, to uh, grow into the image of God, to use uh, Hick's language, uh, or to live in a world uh, worthy of the redemption which God will eventually bestow at the end of time. Uh, so that may uh, be, satisfy some people, um, but I think there's a deeper problem uh, within uh, Hicks, Irenae, and Theodicy, namely his emphasis on uh, the idea of an epistemic distance. Now, the epistemic distance uh, is an idea which is sort of related to this, this notion of freedom uh, and the idea that it is important that human beings come to love and trust in God of their own free will. Uh, if it was clear to human beings that there is a God and that God is good, it would be easy to trust uh, in that God. So for Hick, it is very important that there is an epistemic distance which separates uh, knowledge of that good and all-powerful loving God from the realities that we live in. We live in a world which is ambiguous and which doesn't provide us clear indication that there is a good, all-loving, uh, powerful God. And so uh, for Hick, uh, that space, that gap between the world as it is uh, and the truth of God's love is the space that allows human beings to develop into the image of God. Now, uh, that, uh, again, I think at first glance, it seems like a, a somewhat satisfactory answer. Uh, but what if we uh, step back and uh, think more carefully about this notion of epistemic distance? Now, this all assumes that there is a shared experience of this epistemic distance, uh, as if there is a kind of generic humanity and we all uh, live in this gap between the reality of suffering in the world uh, and the possibility of realizing the truth of God's love and goodness, uh, and, and we all experience this in the same way. But I think there are good reasons to ask uh, whether or not that is the case. And thinking about the problem of evil in terms of slavery and racism uh, are a good example of why we might question that assumption. Uh, indeed, uh, much of the work that occurs in black liberation theology uh, and in other, uh, from other perspectives that are trying to think about the problem of evil in new and interesting ways starts with this very question. Why is it that some groups of people have disproportionately experienced suffering and evil uh, compared to other groups of people. Uh, and uh, this uh, results in questions that are really difficult and challenging. Uh, questions like, uh, is God uh, racist? Uh, and uh, that, that very challenging question, which comes from uh, William Jones, and which I'll talk about uh, in a future video, uh, puts before us a very stark question. Why is it that some people seem to experience suffering more than other people? Now, Jones uh, acknowledges that that question isn't a question uh, limited to uh, the experiences of black people. Uh, he also talks about uh, you know, whether uh, God is uh, anti-Semitic, which uh, for him seems like a natural question to ask uh, following the Holocaust. Uh, and his question is, why don't we start uh, with those uh, difficult, challenging questions uh, rather than just assuming uh, that, that God is good. 
So this brings us back to uh, this, this question of epistemic distance. While there are some uh, winning points in both the free will defense and Hicks, Irenaean theodicy, uh, there are two uh, faulty assumptions. One, uh, in relying on an eschatolog eschatological resolution, uh, it assumes that God is good, uh, when in fact God's goodness is the very thing that's trying to be proven or at least defended. Uh, and two, uh, in thinking about Hicks' Irenaean theodicy, there's an assumption that uh, all people experience suffering and evil uh, in the same kind of way. Uh, but when we look at the world and see uh, evil and suffering distributed uh, unevenly uh, across the world uh, and throughout history, we have some uh, much more difficult questions to ask. And it's not clear uh, that Hick or uh, any version of the free will defense is up to that challenge. Now, it's not like philosophers of religion haven't thought about some of the objections I've been, been raising uh, when it comes to responding to real, historical, concrete examples of evil and suffering in the world. Uh, Alvin Plantinga, for example, in his work on the free will defense, makes it very clear uh, that he thinks what he is offering is a, uh, an abstract philosophical solution to an abstract philosophical problem. He's dealing with the problem of logic not with a problem which is existential in nature. It's not about people's lived realities. Uh, and he says, you know, this may not be a satisfying answer uh, for people to hear in the midst of their suffering, um, but that's a, a question for pastoral responses to the problem of evil uh, rather than philosophical or theological responses. Now, there's certainly uh, a kind of coherence to that argument. There's no denying that that's, uh, that's true. Um, but we can also ask whether or not that's a, a satisfying response. After all, part of the reason that the problem of evil is such a challenge to belief in God is because of the existential weight of, of evil and suffering in the world. Uh, when we look around the world and we see evil and suffering, it seems very strange that we would sort of take, take stock of that suffering then abstract from that reality, solve a logical problem, and then think, well, that, that works, uh, without then returning to apply that solution to the actual way that things uh, happen in the world uh, that we experience. Indeed, you could say that uh, choosing to see evil and suffering primarily as a logical problem, separated from people's lived realities, is itself a kind of privileged position to hold. Uh, to, to think that a response to suffering could do anything other than respond to the actual sufferings of real people in history and today uh, seems a, a very strange way of approaching such a challenging issue.